Welcome to the Yoga Podcast, keeping it real with your host, Claudia Azula Altucher. Um, good morning. Welcome to the Yoga Podcast. I'm thrilled to have with me Gregor Malley. He is um, a practitioner of yoga and he has been practicing for over 35 years. In the middle of the 1980s, he started traveling yearly to India, where he studied with various yogic and tantric masters. Gregor has published four amazing books, two on yoga asana, the primary and the intermediate series of Ashtanga Yoga, one on pranayama, and one on meditation. And these books have been translated into many languages. His teachings incorporate not just posture, but also purification, pranayama, meditation, devotion, and yoga philosophy. And he offers workshops, retreats, and teacher trainings worldwide. The main blog uh, website is 8limbs.com. Gregor, welcome to the show. I'm thrilled to have you. Thanks for joining me. Thanks for having me, Claudia. It's a great pleasure. That's great. So it's 8 p.m. in Sydney, right? That's right. Yes, it is 8 p.m. here. And what did you do today? Sorry, that just dropped out. Can you oh, hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Um, I, was wondering, oh, okay. I was wondering what did you do today? How is a day in the life of Gregor? Uh, the day today was spent with uh, practicing yoga and uh, reading some yogic texts and doing heaps of meditation and doing a bit of gardening. Oh, how nice! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm. I'm just after a uh, after a tour. I, I recently came back from Tokyo, and I taught in uh, in in Bali and on the uh, um, Australian West Coast. So this is basically a bit of a holiday for me. That's nice. And I saw some photographs in Facebook. You um, you get a, a large following of students in your workshops, about 60, 70 people. Yes, that's correct. Yeah. Yes, um, that is correct. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, that was very interesting that you attract a, a large gathering. I guess um, that's wonderful. I saw that um, recently you and your wife, Monica, bought some land and you are now living in a, in a forest. Uh, yes, that's right. Yeah, that's, that might be a part of why the uh, phone connection is not that great because I'm, I'm not really uh, inside of civilization. So, yes. I do live in an in a rainforest on a mountain top overlooking the Pacific Ocean. That sounds wonderful. And and do you find that the connection with with nature at that level helps you with the practice? Uh, very much so, very much so. And I guess that is something that is is often emphasized in the ancient yoga texts that from a certain point onwards it is uh, suggested that the yogi um, move into nature to, to devote themselves uh, um, more seriously to the, to the so-called higher limbs of yoga. Right, yes. And that's what I want to talk about today because, I mean, I, I am a big fan of your books, as you know. I've uh, reviewed them, I've talked about them, and um, they're very... Uh, they have a lot of the technique, and you've done a lot of research around uh, every one of them. So you talk about how different sages look at different parts of the practice. And you have this distilled knowledge of your lifetime work into them. And to me, it's like someone finally decided to write all of the secrets of yoga and put them in, in four-book form, which is a blessing to all of all of us. Um, but the one I want to focus is, is the latest one called Yoga Meditation. And because I think there's a lot of confusion when it comes to meditation. Would you agree with that? Yes, there is a great confusion. And part of that is that uh, people generally um, uh, take the, the Vedantic and Buddhist, Buddhist uh, uh, translation or meaning of the term meditation. Right. Right. Um, you say in this book, for example, that you've watched uh, in, in amazement a little bit that many students um, are perhaps 
get frustrated with teachers that teach only the asana or the poses part, and then they start looking on their own for meditation techniques, and then they end up maybe doing uh, Buddhist techniques. And that described me. That's what I did. So, for example, I, I went to a vipassana, and it's not really the yoga tradition of meditation. No, no, certainly not. If if you look at, for example, into the Yoga Sutra, which is the defining text of yoga, it's many thousand years old. And there in the Sutra 3.2, for example, the sage Patanjali says that uh, meditation, that is dhyana in Sanskrit, is defined as... Um, a permanent stream of awareness from the meditator towards the object of meditation and a permanent stream of information from the object back to the meditator, which is, of course, quite different, a quite different idea of, um, of, of what we have in, in Vipassana and in, in Buddhism. Right. Uh, so, for example, in Vipassana, they just instruct you to watch the breath and then watch for sensations in the body. And so the idea is that um, all stuff, all conditioning stuff will come up and, and you, will, you will not react to it in the same way you did before um, and, and eventually will clear up. But what I found very interesting is that you say, yes, you may prevent yourself from overreacting in the future. I'm paraphrasing uh, to, to uh, you know, past reactions, but it will not take you deeper into meditation as the yoga tradition does. Am I getting that right? Yes, I guess the, the main thing um, uh, of, of this, uh, about this Vipassana, uh, um, a definition would be vipassana is actually something that has developed out of Buddhism, and um, the, the the main difference between the Buddhism on, and the Vedanta, which is is the Indian or the Hindu equivalent of the Buddhism, and what we teach in yoga is that according to those ide so-called idealistic schools like the Buddhism and the Advaita Vedanta, the world is an illusion, whereas in yoga the world is seen as real. So the meditator has actually a keen interest in, in the world, uh, which is you know, for us much more interesting than, for example, our own conditioning. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I see. And so, um, and so this, this sort of like um, concentration that you were describing or, or, or uh, focusing on an object and receiving from the object is actually more the, the, the way of yoga. It's not so much observing sensations, it's concentrating on, on an object. Um, yes, that's right. So, for example, we wouldn't really, I mean, you know, the yoga is very much interested in uh, placing the body in, in, let's say, a perfect uh, uh, position, which, you know, the yogis would consider that either Padmasana, the lotus posture, or Siddhasana, a, a similar posture to that, uh, would be perfect uh, yoga positions for various reasons. But um, one of the reasons is that in those positions, the body can eventually become so light and, and effortless that we can completely go beyond the body. That mm -hmm. means leaving the body behind so that we can go deeper into the spiritual aspects of the meditation. Mm -hmm. Now, what I've seen around from people who are interested in yoga, there is a, it, it, there's a lot of difficulty with, never mind the lotus, but just sitting down. Um, there's a lot of curved spines, um, uh, bad posture. Um, and nevertheless, you recommend, you say, do not wait to start meditation, start, start trying it early on. So for someone, say, who, who would like to perhaps get into your teachings, read, practice, uh, that cannot sit in, in any of the four postures that you recommend, sort of like one is kneeling or, 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 or the, um, uh, well, the other one is, is a modified. Just cut out. Oh, I'm sorry. Can you hear me now? Yes, I can hear you. Sorry okay, so for someone who cannot sit easily, what, what would you recommend uh, to get started with yes. this? Yeah, okay, there's actually a, a so-called meditation bench, which brings you in a similar position as the uh, as the Virasana position, so that you're basically sitting... Uh, in a kneeling position, but you're not sitting into, on your heels, but 
your sit bones are slightly elevated. I um, see. So, yeah, so that would be the, the advantage of such a meditation bench is that your spine is still in the ideal double S curve. Right. So, so the low curvature and the, cerv and the cervical curvature of the spine are respected, so to speak. That, that's, that, that's correct, yes. That's, that's good. That's a very good tip for anyone who may want to try your practices but cannot just yet see it. Yes. yes. So, um, but what I like about you and this book in particular is there's a lot of talk of the first four limbs, you know, like the do's and don'ts and then the, the asana yeah. or posture. And even pranayama has begun. Your book, I think, has helped um, to, to bring it more into the forefront of yoga. But there is very little talk on yoga meditation. And in your book, you say you're focusing on the last four limbs. And I really like that. Great. Fantastic. Yeah. And um, so you describe, you say that you're going to talk about meditation as it being all four limbs, all the last four limbs. Is that right? Yes, it is. Yeah. Um, well, you know, the... Um, The way how I have uh, described the meditation in this book, it contains mainly the Pratyahara and the Dharana, which are the fourth and, uh, sorry, the fifth and the sixth limb. And then the Dhyana, um, the, the, the seventh limb, is actually the success in, in the fifth and the sixth limb. And then once the, the Dhyana has happened, then one can on, go on to the final limb, the samadhi, which in itself is, is an extra uh, um, a, a form of practice. Right. And you, w interesting thing on Pratyahara or the fifth limb, you say um, Patanjali in the Yoga Sutras, uh, by the way, Pratyahara is when we can withdraw the senses. And um, yes. uh, Uh, is not described how do you do it is not described in the yoga sutras but you go ahead and do research and describe how can one do pratyahara so would you That's get, right. can you tell us please how can we do pratyahara is there a way to do it yes yes sure but be, before I, i set out to explain that is um Uh, Patanjali actually doesn't say about any of the eight limbs how you have to do it. He only defines them, uh, what, which, what is the result when you have achieved them. So it, th that's not limited to Pratyahara, but even about Asana and Panayama, he just explains uh, uh, the success of, of, of the limbs. Right. Yeah. Now, to, co to um, talk about Pratyahara, there is basically in the uh, yoga tradition um, three different uh, uh, streams of thought or schools of thought how uh, the Pratyahara is to be practiced. And one would be, one would be to um, focus on the chakras during Pranayama. And that is, a, is a, an approach that the sage uh, Yagnavalkya has described in the Yoga Yagnavalkya, that is a very important, influential uh, uh, yogic text, one of the most important ones. Mm -hmm. So, um, and, and in that way, I have suggested to practice the, uh, the Pratyahara yeah, in, in my book. Then there is a, a second school of, of thought, which, um, which I have, uh, well, which I call the uh, Uh, Raja Yoga approach and in the Raja Yoga that is the Royal Yoga um, and one could probably argue that this is the way how Patanjali would have practiced it although he hasn't pointed it out uh, mm -hmm. explicitly but in the Raja Yoga the, um, the five senses are projected back into the body by using um, mudras and bandhas yeah mm -hmm. now what i have suggested in my uh, in my book as the um, fastest way to success is to actually um, combine those two methods because it's the most powerful way of doing it that you while you practice the deep breathing and you focus on the chakras uh, you are actually applying all of those mudras simultaneously this is the fastest way to success mm -hmm. now there is a third way 
of practice in Pratyahara, and that has been described uh, by another ancient yogi. Uh, his name was Goraknath. He is the founder of the Hatha Yoga tradition, or Hatha Yoga as it's called today. And he describes in a text called the Yoga Gorakshataka, which means the 100 verses of Goraknath. Um, interestingly, of those 100, 100 verses, uh, 12 verses are devoted to... Um, uh, to Pratyahara, so that shows how, how important the subject actually is, whereas nowadays in modern yoga it's completely neglected. Now, mm-hmm. Goraknath says that it should be practiced by practicing inversions, uh, such as shoulder stand and headstand, for an extended period of time, and so I've suggested in my book to include that as well, um, mm-hmm. and, and practice the inversions as well, but uh, of course not while we are sitting in a meditation posture. That would be different. Right? Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and now that I have mentioned the uh, the inversions, uh, there is a bit of a, a negative uh, publicity at the moment uh, out on inversions. But the problem is that uh, people are. Uh, some people have tried to stay in, in headstand and shoulder stand, which are the main inversions, for as long as possible without actually having mastered the technique. And the mas- mastering the technique, of course, means that there is uh, very, very little weight uh, to be placed on the head. Yeah, So that needs, you, you should hold the headstand only to that uh, amount of time as you can hold pretty much most of the weight or all, all, almost all the weight in your arms. Yeah. And then right. there's no negative effect. Yeah. I'm glad you say that because I think even though these uh, kind of secrets have uh, become available to all of us now through books like yours, uh, it's very important to respect the fact that you cannot just sort of whip the body into do this. Uh, it, it needs some preparation. It needs to be ready for it. And if we overdo it, we That's correct, we yes. hurt ourselves. Now you um, you yes. divide this book into uh, eighteen laws, and I really like lists, so I thought that was really cool. Okay. <laughs> and so you have. I, I obviously I'm I'm not gonna uh, talk about all of them because it, as p- people would have to read the book. There's a lot of material there. But you have first you have the six laws on hatha yoga, or or, or yes. yeah. Then there is correct. raja yoga, and then there is yes. Uh, bhakti or the yoga of devotion. Correct. Yes. So the first one is um, is is the hatha yoga, which is kind of like what we know, the yoga we know, the the, the asana, right. the pranayama, and you say that the um, the first law of success in meditation is powered by kundalini. But I think kundalini is another of those areas where people just have all kinds of ideas. So c- can you maybe tell us uh, um, w- what is Kundalini properly understood? Okay. Um, let, let me throw one thing in first, and that is uh, the reason why I have uh, divided uh, the book into those three parts and have uh, uh, talked about the Hatha, the uh, Raja, and the Bhakti aspects of the practice is that nowadays people often say, I'll do this and this yoga as in opposed to that and that. But it's important to realize that in, in the ancient days, in ancient society, there was only one yoga being practiced, and that was Maha Yoga, the great yoga or the totality of yoga. Mm-hmm. So if I was a, a, a Hatha Yoga practitioner in those days, I didn't think that I was practicing Hatha because I do not like Raja or I do not like Kundalini Yoga or I do not like Jnana Yoga or Bhakti Yoga, but because I thought at this point in my life, that is where I am. So that is where what I'm practicing. And at a later point, I will integrate all of those other aspects of yoga. And I think this is something, this approach of Maha Yoga, of the great yoga, to acknowledge all of those many different aspects of yoga and to graduate from one tier or layer to the next. This is something that we are we are losing in modern yoga. I see. So you're saying all, all three of these really is yoga. You, you can't just pick and choose. They, they, they're all integrated. Yes. Well, in ancient society, everybody started with Hatha yoga, mm-hmm. with the physical aspects of yoga. And then as you uh, developed, you would go on to uh, to the Raja Yoga, which are the more uh, mental aspects of it, and then you would go on to the to the Bhakti Yoga, which is the devotional part, and eventually the yoga would 
culminate in, in all cases in the jnana, that is the yoga of knowledge. Nowadays we have people, they say, oh, I don't want to do hatha yoga, I, do, I go straight to jnana, or I'm a bhakti yoga, yogi. This is not how it, 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 uh, it took place in ancient society. Mm -hmm. and, and in everyday life too, I suppose, if, if you're sick, there is no way you're going to have knowledge of, of all the universe, right? Or, or if you're... If you, if, if, if you can't yes. breathe, if you can't concentrate, it's very difficult to, to reach this state of full knowledge. Yes, that, that is correct. Yeah, yeah. So uh, the aspects need to be practiced uh, uh, one, one part after the other, and, and eventually they all culminate into one. Now, let me go on to your to a question about uh, Kundalini. Uh -huh. uh, inter interestingly enough, um, there was uh, uh, recently when I, I taught in, in Tokyo, in Japan, um, I, uh, I managed to get a bit of an uh, insight into um, the Shinto religion, which is the ancient religion of, uh, of Japan. It is much older than, uh, than, uh, than the Buddhism there. Mm -hmm. And I actually found it very, very uh, fascinating. So the Shinto basically says that... Um, the the divine is is something which is like a substance um, which which is in all places and it, it is in all people, but it is in some people and in some places stronger than in others. But it is something that you can cultivate um, through what they call the path or the right action. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now it's very interesting because uh, that brings me to. Um, in, in all mystical traditions of, of humankind, it was always taught that true knowledge has a, a physical aspect. It is not just something which, which, uh, which is in your mind. And so the Kundalini is basically that physical aspect. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I see. So, so I see. So, so it's a way of, of getting to this, um, using the body to get in access to the divine uh, yes yes we yes we could say that yes i see that that's very interesting so uh, so we start there and then the you talk about the law number 2 is uh, negating gravity i want to say to so to speak in english so to speak um is is the first engine of this uh, so in 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 the body i guess if we're starting there negating the forces of gravity within us or uh, sending the the apana forces the forces that throw us down up that does that, that correct. does that have to do with uh clearing say emotional issues or our um issues with sex and relationships and money and things like that Yes, yes, it, it is related to that. So everything that you have mentioned now are issues which are related to the lower three chakras. And uh, if, if you don't work um, consciously on yourself, uh, due to gravitation, there is a, a downward trajectory of what we call in yoga the life force, which is the prana. And that will always... Um, uh, draw the life force down to the to the lower chakras, and you know if you look, for example, at our uh, cu current or uh, contemporary culture, and for example at at reality TV, mm, um, yeah. <laughs> there there is is very much you know we talk always about you know this and this character they expose themselves warts and all, but what we are really looking for is actually those lower urges represented in in people. You know, so if, if you even looked at the movies, um, say, just a, f a few decades ago, 30, 40, th th three, four, five decades ago, uh, the, the ma characters were often larger than life figures, which who had something heroic about themselves. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And but now but now we want to have day to day characters because we want to um to identify with the human frailty, for example, you know, right. and and it, or if if you if if a if a movie is being advertised.
Uh, you always hear, or you often hear this phrase, uh, it's a sizzling cocktail of lust, uh, <laughs> revenge, uh, revenge and betrayal, you know. So just listen to that, lust, revenge and betrayal, yeah, and it's a sizzling cocktail of the three. This is what we want for entertainment, you right, know. Right, right. And, and so whereas, you know, if you just look at, you know, like uh, the characters that were still uh, described, just... Um, um, uh, maybe four or five decades ago, or even in in literature, uh, one or two centuries ago, they were often heroic. You know, they they were the sort of people that we were aspiring to become. Right. And uh, and and this is has very much gone out the window. And and the yoga is actually um, uh, trying to develop that, trying to bring that part out of you, 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 your nobility, basically. And I'm not talking about aristocracy, but I'm talking about developing your, your highest potential, right. the highest you could potent possibly become. So, so maybe not watching too much TV could be one way to start to clear that up, for example. Yes, very much so. You know, like I mean, the yogi would uh, would suggest that uh, you know you you actually uh, um, use uh, the, if if you want to use entertainment, then you know choose sources that that depict individuals in in the way in which what you want to who you want to become. That's right. Yeah, yeah. That's very interesting. Um, and you also talk about, like, and I guess this is for more advanced yogis, um, uh, or, or maybe not. I mean, I try once in a while to do a little bit of a fasting and not eat so much because you yes. say, yeah, you say this interferes as well uh, because it, um, wh why, why does food interfere? All right. Um, now, I want to start for, say first one thing about fasting, and that is, if you want to try fasting, uh, I, I strongly suggest that you get a fasting book uh, written by an expert, such as a medical doctor, because there's a couple of things that you have to do properly. You know, you need to uh, eliminate completely and clean clean the bowels and and etc. So That's right. And you and you explain all of that in the book very clearly, by the way. Yeah, yeah, pr pr probably not enough in detail to, to do a fast according to what I say there, but there is excellent fasting books around. So if, you, if you're interested in fasting, any of our listeners, I would suggest to get yourself a, a fasting book and do it properly. But let me explain the mechanism why it is being done. Mm -hmm. have, a, have a quick look at the fact that all of the founders of, of the major religions, you know, whether it's uh, Gautama Buddha or whether it is Muhammad the prophet, or whether it is Jesus Christ, or whether it is the Jewish prophets, or whether it's the Vedic rishis, that they all went into the desert, into the jungle, on mountaintops, etc., and fasted. Right. And then eventually they got their, um, their uh, spiritual freedom, their visions from that. Yeah? Mm -hmm. This is uh, very similar to actually what the Native Americans did and also what the Australian Aborigines did in the, in the Aborigines, for example, had uh, a, a, a coming of age uh, a ritual which was called walkabout in which the young warriors um, basically had to set out and leave their community and and wander through the desert alone by themselves without food for a month. Yeah, mm -hmm. And during, during that time, they had spiritual visions, you know, and the same was done by by the Native Americans. So um, the fasting it would, would be probably the main uh, uh, inspiration or the main source that in the last few thousand years uh, human beings had mystical experiences. Now let me explain the mechanism. Mm -hmm. um, the, the peristalsis in the body is, is the mechanism that actually drives uh, food uh, from the mouth, from the oral orifice, uh, all the way down to, to where it is eliminated, to the uh, rectal orifice. And so it is, the peristalsis is a milking movement uh, of the intestines or of the alimentary canal to drive the food through the body. It doesn't actually fall through the body by gravitation. Even if you were in, in a headstand, mm -hmm. you would still be 
be, be digesting. Now that peristalsis is, is the physical manifestation of what we call in yoga the apana, that is the, uh, the vital down current. Now this apana is the main uh, uh, reason why um, the kundalini does not rise. I see. Yeah? Um, because the apana holds the kundalini down. And if this apana is uh, turned, either, either switched off or turned around, main techniques, by the way, to turn it around, are uh, mula and udiyana bandha, which a lot of yogis know, will know those terms. They are internal muscular locks. But uh, the, the most straightforward uh, uh, way to um, to switch that apana off would be to to fast and to, to completely clear out the the intestine, and then the the apana would be just switched off like that. And then usually from the fifth day onwards, um, people will start having very very deep spiritual experiences if they do practice some form of uh, of meditation or, or spiritual discipline anyway. I see that that's very interesting. So b b because this milking of, of the system that is constantly dragging us down would stop, then we would feel more elevated states, I suppose, after a certain amount of time. Um, that, that is correct. And, and notice also that where the intestines are positioned, that is actually this area uh, which is inhabited by the three lower chakras, the three lower energy centers. And, and so what is happening is that by this constant massaging of the, uh, of the, uh, um, uh, of the intestines, of those three centers, they are constantly activated. Yeah? And so they are powering first fear and the survival function and, and also aggression, that is the lowermost uh, uh, chakra. Then the next one is, of course, the reproductive issue and uh, sexual identification, etc. And the next one, and, 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 and the lower emotions. Right. And the third one, of course, um, material greed and, and egotism, uh, the uh, the desire to, to dominate others. Right. So no wonder we eat more, we watch more TV to keep up with the Kardashians and notice who is dating who, and then we eat some more and, and it yes. powers the cycle. Yes, that's right. Whereas if you, if, if you clean out the, uh, the, uh, the abdomen and, and you would fast for a while, you just would absolutely not care at all about any of those uh, issues. Right. Now, for example, for me being a person in the world, I, I, is, I, I don't think I would even want to take five days out of food. I, I like the food for now. I'm not that detached. But do, would you say um, doing, say, a, a fasting once in a while, which I try to do like a 16-hour fast or something like that, um, is conducive, uh, sort of like moving forward? Is, is that helpful? Uh, very much so. I, I think by, by now it is also recognized uh, by Western science that, uh, 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 that short fasts are actually the only thing that will, see, that will definitely increase your life expectation hmm. because it will also reduce your cancer markers, uh, uh, your, your uh, chances of getting diabetes, etc. So it is actually a very, very – those short fasts are probably more a thing that are good for health. I see. Whereas, you know, if you do want to, um, uh, you know, go into the spiritual dimension, they, they need to, it needs to be, of course, longer. Do you have, do you do any retreats in which you take students through this? Is this part of your routine as a teacher? No, no, not at all. And so the, the reason is that uh, yogis in generally uh, do not do long fasts. And the reason why is because... Um, uh, it, it will interfere, of course, with your ability to to uh, to perform yoga. You know, right. so you could not do you could not do a serious asana practice at a time when you were uh, doing a fast. Yeah, right. So, uh, which which of course it could be argued then well you wouldn't need it anyway. But the the way how yogis get around that whole problem is is that um, instead of uh, having no food at all, the yogis will actually um, uh, use only food which does not um, aggravate the apana. That means food which is very, very light and doesn't draw the apana down. So, uh, you know, as a category, those are all of the sattvic foods 
uh, chiefly fruit and veg, you know, and of course, um, foods such as meat mm. is very, very tamasic. It is very, very heavy right. and therefore um, uh, uh, creates a lot of apana and, and, ver- and draws very much uh, uh, your, your awareness and your identification down to those lower chakras. I see. I see. That's very interesting. Now let, let 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 me just throw throw that in not not to be sort of not to appear prejudiced. Uh-huh. You can overcome that. You can overcome that. So even with a meat diet, of course, you can have spiritual ex- experiences. You would just need to do a, a, a um, perform a bit, make up the missing points in some of the other disciplines. I see. So for a meat, if for a person say that because of, and you say this in your book, some people cannot stop eating meat because of their biology and where they come from and how they were raised, and it may take longer uh, to to let go yes. of meat. Uh, so, so, so yes. what what's one thing that sort of uh, like compensates? Uh, it, would it be more practice of asana, or, or what would what would it be? Yes. For example, you know, to, to do more asana practice uh, would be helpful and you may have to, to spend uh, a bit more time in, in, uh, in meditation and, uh, you know, there's also techniques called kriyas who, who would be very helpful. But, you know, there's also, of course, a lot of other uh, um, uh, aspects of the yoga that we haven't really touched yet uh, a devotional relationship for example you know like uh, to uh, to the divine is is, uh, is is very powerful and that can help you overcome a lot and another aspect of course is to to avoid uh, toxic thoughts or, or emotions in any way you know? mm, again mm. this is of course something that is not taught at all in our, in our society that's right and and that's very interesting because it brings me in in the law number three where you have converting metabolic fire into intelligence and you talk about oh, thoughts okay. and and how um it's important to keep our thought patterns clean and it made me laugh yes. because you talk about the secret which is a uh, it's, it's kind of a, a, an interesting movie that took root in society uh, like wildfire, maybe because yes. uh, it, it, it caters to the three lower chakras, right? It's like, I, I want a car. Yes. I'm just going to think about the car and get the car. <laughs> yes, that's right. So, you know, it's interesting because as such, the technology that is described in The Secret is correct. You need to take responsibility for uh, for your thoughts, yeah. yeah. But of course, where where the secret um, uh, completely fell short is uh, it's only focusing on what you can have, uh, as in opposed to who you can be, yeah. Mm, right. And uh, you know, if if I may hear, if I may hear quickly, uh, um, um, a quote: uh, Jesus Christ, Jesus said. Um, uh, seek ye first the kingdom of heaven and everything else will be added on. In other words, may, I want to translate that into modern language. What he was saying is the important thing is that you do have a spiritual practice and that you do have a spiritual realization and then abundance, material abundance will come as a result of that. Mm-hmm. But don't start chasing material abundance because material abundance will chase you if you start giving out a lot, then you will automatically receive. Mm-hmm. That, that's, that's very, very interesting. And you know, I, I'm not a very advanced practitioner of yoga, but I have experienced that, that uh, through practice and eventually letting go of what I thought I wanted, then what I thought I wanted came to me <laughs> in a strange way um, at, the yes. mom- at the moment of releasing yes. it. Um, it's very, very interesting. Yes. So, um, yeah. um, moving a little bit on onto the Raja Yoga side uh, of things, you you talk about Raja Yoga, which is the the, the yoga of the mind, right? Correct. Yes. Uh, as being uh, as attempting to get your mind to be laser focused concentration, because um, the last four limbs of yoga are all about first you withdraw the senses so you can concentrate, and you talk yes. about. Our Obindo, who had a very yes. interesting story, and what can we learn from Our Obindo? 
Uh, from our window, we can learn quite a few different things. And one would be uh, um, our window was on death row at the time of, of uh, being presented with a uh, meditation technique. And famously, with that meditation technique, which is, is very, very simple, uh, he succeeded in only three days. But since then, <laughs> nobody has succeeded with that meditation technique. And part of, and, and part of the reason why Aubindo succeeded, part, apart from being himself a very amazing <laughs> being, was that uh, there was nothing else to do but to meditate, yeah? Right. And so, because he was basically uh, uh, in, in, in prison and he, uh, he was waiting for a show trial uh, with a, a possible de oh. death sentence. With a death, death sentence, and so that's right, yeah. there was nothing that was left to do but to, sit and, and, but to sit and meditate, you know, as if death was breathing down his neck, which it literally was. Right. I was saying that Aurobindo was given this technique by which he would, you say in the book, uh, he had to observe the thoughts, notice that they were not being generated by, by him, but rather he was, they were coming in and then Correct. let them go. Correct. Correct. Yes. Um, now, I think that if I knew I was going to die, I would have a lot of trouble with that because the fear of death is so big. Yes. But yeah. I suppose he didn't have that fear and, and, and he succeeded with that. Well, on the other hand, the fear of death or the fear of the unknown or the fear of what, what may be on the other side is also an incredible motivation. You know, like for example, in, in the, uh, the... Hello? Oh. Oh, oh. Any given time, they realize that they remember that that God is, uh, sorry, death is breathing down their neck and they have to get on with their, with their life, you know, because in many ways, so many things that we are doing is entertainment and, and killing time. Here it is, killing time. When you are in a situation like that, that you know, well, there's a good chance that you're dead in, in three days. Yeah. You don't want to kill time anymore. You will use every single breath and that's the attitude that we would need in meditation to succeed quickly right that's 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 right and um yes. but, but you, you say this in general doesn't seem to work for many of us which is true and and you say then that we need to choose when we see to concentrate what to focus on because if we don't choose what to focus on it's going to choose us meaning the mind will go out and try to choose something to focus on all the time yes yes and so this is where where yoga very much differs with buddhism and, and with vipassana because in in uh, the aim in in buddhism and vipassana is basically to to become aware of awareness or to become aware of consciousness the consciousness is is that what is uh, eternal infinite formless and qualityless and by definition the mind cannot wrap itself around it if mm. you just imagine for a moment that you have an object that is eternal and infinite and the mind is wrapping it trying to wrap itself around it it's not possible because the mind is finite right so therefore Therefore, yoga uses the very structure of the mind uh, to, to, let's say, um, to cultivate it. Yeah? So the mind is a survival tool and it is designed to attach itself to something that has form and quality. And that's why we are starting with very, very simple meditation objects before we go to something as, as, uh, as incredible as awareness. Right, right. And so y your suggestion is actually to, uh, which is what you were saying in the beginning, is, is to focus on, on the chakras. And, and you go on to an explanation of, of them. And they have, um, as, as you get into it, they have sounds associating uh, to them. They have drawings. Uh, so it, it's a very elaborate process until you get to the yoga of devotion. That, that is correct, but uh, if I if I may just throw yes, that in quickly, please. Uh, we we have let's 
as a yogi, we have already practiced to start. We start with asana, and so asana is basically a meditation on the body and space, and it is also a meditation on the on the ujjayi breath, how the breath flows through the body. It is a meditation on the bandhas which you are holding du- during your asana practice. So, in some ways, all of the vital points of meditation are already in place. You are used to using your eyes and to, to attach them to focal points, to lock them into focal points. And and so all of those vital elements of uh, of meditation are already in place. Then you go on and you learn pranayama, the breathing exercises, which where you now sit in a meditation position. So asana is still there, but has gone a little bit in the background. Now the breath is the number one meditation object, but already here during pranayama, you have uh, um, ancillary uh, meditation objects, which are now mantra, that is you use mantra, the pronunciation of mantra, to uh, to count your breath, and uh, you know still there is drishti and there is bandha as well, and also uh, you're using visualization, because during... Um, during pranayama, you're, visual, you're supposed to visualize on the sun and the moon, mm-hmm. which are nothing but the solar and lunar energy centers, pranic batteries in the body. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So what I'm saying is the structural elements of yogic posture, of yogic breathing and yogic meditation are exactly the same. It is only that... Um, the focus shifts gradually as we as we go on from technique to technique. So by the time we come to actual yogic meditation, not only the posture but also the breath is not in the foreground anymore, but still present. I see. I see. Is it right? Right. But now, but now mantra. And Yes, but now mantra and chakra, which is the visualization that we use in yoga, uh, are now coming into the foreground. That's right. That that's very interesting. And you know, uh, since you mentioned that, it brought to mind um, uh, when you were talking about pranayama and how it fits into the process, the breathing. Uh, you talk at length about how meditation actually cannot happen if you're breathing predominantly more with the right nostril, for example, um, as opposed to the, the left, and that is ideal when both are flowing together. Yes, th- that is, is, is very, very important to understand that a lot of people, they, they try um, uh, meditation and they find it very uh, frustrating and they don't get anywhere. You can't receive anything. You can't receive any higher knowledge or let me even say log on to a higher meditation object and download knowledge unless you uh, either have a lunar breath that is more breath in the left nostril or ideally even uh, a fully synchronized that is uh, both nostrils uh, flow in the same way or the breath is is even suspended which we then call the breathless state yeah now the problem is that the whole way how we are living our life as extroverts um, makes us solar that means the whole go out go getter dominate uh, um, and uh, dominate other people and accumulate wealth is all very much so-called solar thinking, which means that the breath flow through the right nostril and this is all okay, but during that time, meditation cannot succeed. So the average uh, co- uh, co- contemporary will actually get frustrated by the meditation process. That's why yoga puts so much emphasis on on pranayama to learn that first, so that you you learn to either switch on the lunar channel or the so-called central channel uh, and. Uh, with lunar channel, uh, the left nostril, you will succeed um, with, with meditation. But when you manage to switch on that so-called central energy channel, you will have a mystical experience, a spiritual breakthrough experience, spiritual awakening very, very quickly. 
Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes, and you know, w when you mentioned that, it it kind of gave me an aha moment because I've been to some of uh, retreat centers uh, that offer meditation where they have you sitting for days on end. And I found that A, the practice of asana helped me as opposed to other people who couldn't, really couldn't sit for that long because their bodies were not prepared. But I didn't know this part, that the importance of being able to breathe through bro both nostrils nostrils uh, or the lunar nostril and I, the, it seemed to me that they were kind of important things to keep in mind if we were to sit for so long so I'm um, yes uh, this is ve very important so in the beginning you you mentioned that in vipassana um, you know part of the the uh, the work is by slowly letting go to you of your conditioning Right. Now, one thing that cannot be put enough emphasis on is that in yoga, and this has been described in a yogic text called the Taitiriya Upanishad, which is more than 6,000 years old, and then that text was, is already described, that conditioning is actually located and encrypted simultaneously in body, breath, and mind. Mm. And, and, and this is... This is if, if anything, then it's that that is, is really the, the, the central tenet of my teaching. And in, in case, in, and in fact, it's one of the central tenets of yogi teaching since 6,000 years ago. If you only practice asana, that is posture, it is very, very unlikely that you succeed and there is an uphill task. Yeah, mm -hmm. It's an uphill battle. The same thing is if you only practice meditation, Exactly the same thing is is happening. Right. Most people that only practice meditation and nothing else will not achieve uh, liberation, spiritual freedom. And it's the same thing with if you only would do breathing exercises. This the odds it is possible, but the odds are stacked against you. Mm. But if you practice simultaneously yogic posture yogic breathing exercises and yogic meditation the odds are now stacked in your favor and the reason why this is the case let me explain that yeah. briefly yeah uh the so-called conditioning yeah um patanjali describes the conditioning also we, we call it vasana but um the the vasana consists of all of the obstacles to yoga and patanjali describes the obstacles obstacles in the uh, yoga sutra 130 and so the important thing to realize that those nine obstacles that he mentions there in the Sutra 130 are located in body, breath, and mind. Right. Now those obstacles, and so you have to imagine that your being is like a crystal. And so now imagine the outermost layers of the, the three outer layers of that crystal um, are opaque because conditioning is located in them. And so Patanjali and the ancient yogis have said, okay, you have to simultaneously practice um, asana, pranayama, and meditation to purge the conditioning and those obstacles from those outermost layers, body, breath, and mind. Asana purges the obstacles from the body. Right. Pranayama purges the obstacles from the breath. Meditation purges the obstacles from the mind. If you only do meditation, what will happen is that your conditioning, the vasana, uh, will reboot from the body and the breath because the conditioning has three backup drives. Yeah. Mm. So if, if it gets deleted from the mind through your effort in meditation, the conditioning is still there in the body and in the breath. If you are an only asana practitioner nowadays, modern yoga culture, uh, so many people are trapped in the body. They get completely trapped in this idea, uh, if I only make the body so powerful, it, it won't help a lot because the conditioning is still located in your breath and your mind. So the yogis have taught that since thousands of years. There, there was a very, very sophisticated psychology, basically, right. that you have to... To, to purify those outermost layers and then basically Patanjali says in the in the in the in the Yoga Sutra 141 this is the most incredible of all uh, uh, sutras where he says once the crystal of the mind uh, this is a bit like a, 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 um, an interpretation or contains already an interpretation here but let me uh, say it in this way if the um, 
crystal of the mind is completely purified, that is being made samadhik, that means capable of samadhi, then whatever this laser-like concentrated mind, this poor pure crystal now placed on, will truly represent that, whether it, it is the outer world, mm -hmm. or whether it, whether it is your own psyche, your intelligence, or whether it is the innermost, that is the, your pure consciousness, the awareness, you will be able to authentically and truthfully experience all of that for the first time, which amounts to nothing else, but you, be, you, you will be free then, you know, mm -hmm, because mm -hmm. the yoga basically says what stops us from being truly alive and being from truly ourselves and developing our highest potential and be able to make a contribution to the life of others is the conditioning. The yoga says our problem is that we are living essentially a robotic life. Right. We think, ah, oh, yeah, this is what I want. But hang on, that desire that you identify with is, has been programmed into your mental hard drive, not by yourself. You are acting not out of freedom, you only believe, but you're actually programmed like a robot. Right, right. And you know what? That makes complete sense what you said uh, ev ev even before this last bit, which was amazing, but uh, that if, if you really just sit to meditate, but the body is not with you, then as soon as you get out of the meditation, you'll go back into feeling sick or upset. And the same if you put too much uh, energy into the body. I've seen this in, in interactions with some yogis. Unfortunately, uh, I've had experiences where people are very mean and they don't get the, the part that the mind is acting up on them if you focus too much on the body. Um, and so they need to come into balance. It makes complete sense that you would have to work on breath, body and mind in order to see things clearly and uh, and, and access higher knowledge and see things for what they are, which is what we're trying to do. Um, are you there, Gregor? Did I lose you? Y yes, oh, yes, oh, you're uh, here. absolutely. Yes, yes, I am. Yes, uh, okay. Yeah, yeah, I am. Yeah, okay, yeah, so yeah. let me ask you, um, for someone that's getting into yoga, it's very hard to come by a teacher that will have, you know, this level of understanding, your, your level of understanding. And um, there's a lot out there. What is your suggestion for someone who wants to get started down this path, but is, is afraid of the amount of uh, confusion out there? Yes, well, um, Mm, well, th that is a difficult question. That is a difficult question. Of course, you know, like uh, um, in 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 many ways, you know, uh, the internet, the computers, etc. All of what we have here is absolutely amazing. You know, this is only the reason why actually the two of us can communicate across the world like yeah. this, and and so many people can listen to us. So it is fantastic. But on the other hand, you know, it has uh, multiplied the amount of confusion. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So, uh, you know, but but I I would say yeah, you know, it is um, necessary to be uh, uh, di discriminative, you know, di to be discriminating, you know, because um, this is one thing, you know, I spent a big part big part of my life um, in uh, in in India, and one thing that I w found absolutely astonishing is uh, is the amount of cults, yeah, mm, and right. the amount. Of, of, of sects and the amount of abuse uh, of power, um, which, which you know, is, I suppose, they are exactly the same as in, in all religions, etc. And so, but I found one thing, and that is um, never, never give your power away and never project your power um, onto another being, you know, right. George Gordiev, uh, the, the Armenian mystic that I have quoted already, said one thing that is really, really important, and that is, there's only the only initiation there is is self initiation. That means, even if you find a teacher, um, and and they seem to be triggering a powerful experience in your powerful spiritual uh, experience awakening in you you have to realize one thing and that is you feel that because you have given them the power to trigger that within you 
So, you know, even for a beginner, it is, it is important to never project onto another human being that they may be so amazing and, and, and so semi-divine or even divine omnipotent and all of that. There is no such human being. You know? Right. We are, we, are all, uh, we are all fallible, you know, otherwise we wouldn't be human beings. So the most important thing is you need to keep your critical faculty on yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Very important. And, and, I uh, agree. And keep questioning. You know, a, a teacher that cannot be questioned, you know, is is probably not not a very good teacher. Right. Yes. Absolutely. And and also sh that shifts the responsibility back to me to really make sure that what I'm doing makes sense to me and rings true. Yes. Um, I would like to ask you a, a personal question, Gregor. Um, in, in your years and years of practice, what would say is one thing that maybe took you a long time to understand? Um, uh, let me talk about giving. Um, I think what took me a long time to understand was that in the beginning I thought that uh, spiritual evolution was something that I was doing for myself mm -hmm. and that I was doing it to attain freedom, to, be, uh, to become free of restriction or whatever. And uh, the longer I'm practicing yoga, I realized that actually spiritual freedom is very much related to giving. Wow. In the end in the end what we are here for is to support each other to to give each other and that there's is there's nothing greater and nothing more rewarding but to actually uh, contribute to the spiritual awakening of another being. So I think that very much our world is today obsessed with receiving but I found that the number one thing is that Re receiving is a, is an effect of giving. Wow. And so the 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 spiritual freedom is actually essentially something that results out of your readiness to 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 do service to to give. That's 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 very very interesting. I'm so glad you you, you said that. That's so true. Um, I am incredibly grateful that you joined me today. Do you have any other books in the making, anything coming out or, um, or just teaching for now? Yes, I'm actually, um, you know, starting to collect uh, the outline of a book on, on, uh, on Samadhi, which is, is the next stage of, uh, of yogic practice uh, after. It's basically a follow-on vol volume from the one that we talked about today. Right. So after meditation, so I can't wait for that book, Gregor. That's very, very interesting. I'm, I'm, I can't wait. And tell me, where can people find your workshops? And if they want to go visit and come to your classes, where should they go? Well, um, I have a Facebook page, which is, is uh, Facebook uh, forward slash Gregor dot Mähler. And also I got uh, two websites. One is uh, www dot eight limbs dot com, the number eight. Mm -hmm. And then my new new my blog page is uh, www dot Chintamani yoga dot com. And that is Chinta C H I N T A. C uh, M-A-N-I uh -huh. yoga.com yoga that's right and your last name yes. is M-A-E-H-L-E um, that's correct and where the H goes is important is after before the L-E so I, I always need you to keep that in mind <laughs> That's um, right. <laughs> yes. Gregor, thank you very much for joining me today. And um, I look forward to your next book. I can't wait. It was a great pleasure to talk to you, Claudia. Thanks for having me. Okay. Thanks. Bye-bye. Have a nice day. Bye. Bye. That's all for the Yoga Podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, please leave a review in iTunes and visit theyogapodcast.com for more interviews. Until next time, keep it real. Oh,